In the previous segment, we have looked at different mechanisms uh, for heat conduction. I would like to review the basic conduction equation um, given here. Um, heat um, Q is equal to delta T, the temperature differential, divided by the thermal resistance R. And there is uh, an electrical analog for this, uh, which um, many of us are very familiar with, and that's Ohm's law. Uh, in this equation on the right, uh, current uh, is equal to uh, the voltage uh, delta V divided by the electrical resistance R. So as you can see, uh, the electric current corresponds to the heat, heat flow, and voltage corresponds to the temperature differential. Now units, um, again, are in watts, and watt is energy per um, unit time, or unit, uh, or, or second, and, and the reason uh, we have that uh, per second um, uh, in the uh, unit of heat is because heat is not just energy, but traveling energy, so it has the units of uh, energy uh, per time. And obviously, delta T is given in either Kelvin uh, or uh, degrees Celsius, and from this equation, we can see that the unit of thermal resistance is the unit of temperature, uh, Kelvin or Celsius, uh, divided by uh, watts. Okay, so we can, given the dimensions uh, of a solid, if you are interested in finding the thermal resistance of uh, such a rectangular block as shown here, and we're going to assume that the heat is flowing um, along this um, rectangular block, we can calculate its thermal resistance if we know the dimensions and the thermal conductivity of the material, and the thermal conductivity is given in watts uh, per meter uh, Kelvin. And the equation we have here is uh, very similar uh, to the electrical uh, resistance um, of um, a similar uh, block. So the resistance uh, R um, is given by uh, 1 over the thermal conductivity of the material times delta X, uh, the length of the um, uh, cube or, or re uh, rectangular block, divided by the cross-sectional area. So this is the electrical analog of this, and you can see that the equation has exactly the same form. Um, in this case, uh, the resistance is equal to rho, which is just the reciprocal of uh, conductivity, but in the electrical world, um, this equation is um, more frequently given in resistivity instead of conductivity, so that's the only difference, but the rest is exactly the same, uh, delta x over area. So 1 over uh, electrical conductivity can also uh, be used. So we, these, these uh, equations um, give us a very nice uh, electrical analog uh, for, for thermal conduction processes. And this becomes very helpful because if you're interested in uh, developing a complex uh, thermal model uh, for a system, we can actually uh, try to construct uh, an electrical analog um, using uh, simple resistors and voltage sources, and we can solve um, for um, heat flow. The critical parameter in calculating the thermal resistance of a material is uh, thermal conductivity. So this is a material property, and um, it, it's a constant. So we can talk about, for instance, the thermal conductivity of aluminum. Uh, we can Google it. Uh, we, can, um, uh, we can use it in our equations, and, and so forth. And this is related to um, uh, materials uh, ability uh, to uh, transfer, tra uh, transfer heat uh, in an efficient way. So it's a measure of how heat transfers in a material. And, and this uh, property of the material uh, can be linked to another fundamental parameter called uh, the mean free path. Mean free path is uh, a very simple concept. It is basically uh, the average distance uh, your heat carriers can travel without going into uh, collision events. So your heat carrier, for instance, can be an electron. Um, so then in this case, we are talking about uh, how far an electron can uh, travel uh, without getting into a collision 
uh, with a, another electron. Of course, when this collision occurs, um, there will be some uh, energy exchange uh, taking place. Uh, perhaps the electrons will change uh, their trajectories and, and so forth. So, mean free path is an important property because as you have more collisions, um, it becomes more difficult for the electron to travel uh, through a medium, so heat transfer um, slows um, down. All right, so um, what is... Um, um, how, uh, what is this uh, thermal conductivity uh, determined uh, by? Which parameters? So this is the equation for uh, thermal conductivity. Um, so V is the average uh, velocity um, of uh, the heat carriers in the material. And, and that has to do uh, with the energy of, of these um, uh, carriers, uh, because we are talking about uh, the, the motion here. We're talking about kinetic uh, energy. So that's uh, parameter number one. Uh, parameter number two is the volumetric specific heat. Uh, this is the uh, heat that you need to provide per unit volume uh, to raise the temperature of this material, uh, material by one uh, Kelvin. Okay, and the third uh, parameter is our mean free path. So mean free path is, is, um, is the uh, uh, average distance that um, the uh, carriers can and travel without getting into any collisions or, or sc scattering events. So, um, as you can imagine, um, the thermal conductivity uh, should be uh, proportional to all three parameters. So this equation is um, the general equation for the thermal uh, conductivity of the material. So this one right here is basically um, uh, velocity times distance. Um, the average uh, distance, uh, the mean free path, uh, is equal to average velocity times tau, which is the average time, mean time, uh, between uh, different scattering events. So there is this, this specific heat in this equation is the volumetric specific heat. This can be written as, um, as follows. And in this equation, we have um, um, a specific heat. And this, in this case, this is the heat that you need to provide to unit mass, kilogram of the material needed to raise uh, to temperature um, by one Kelvin. Otherwise, uh, this equation is still uh, pretty much um, exactly the same. Uh, density um, uh, rho uh, stands for the uh, density uh, of the heat carriers uh, given uh, in kilograms um, per meter uh, cube. So density times uh, specific heat uh, times, um, again, uh, the average velocity of the carriers times the mean free path uh, lambda um, gives us um, the uh, thermal uh, conductivity of the material. All right. So far, we have talked about uh, conduction, but um, there are two other forms of heat transfer. The first one um, is, is convection. And in convection, um, as the um, individual heat carriers uh, move, um, and this can be, for instance, in, in a gas, um, so these carriers are moving in, 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 uh, in, in their uh, random directions, but uh, in convection, there is this extra um, uh, force that, that makes them move together in a particular direction with some average velocity. For instance, you may have uh, air uh, flow. Uh, you may have uh, an air current uh, flowing uh, inside the room. You may have a fan, for instance, that's forcing the air uh, to flow. So in, in this case, we are not just talking about... Um, uh, movement of heat. Uh, if you recall, when we talked about the um, uh, gas molecules in that confined box, when heat traveled from one side of the box to the other, um, it was just heat moving. Uh, we didn't necessarily uh, need the actual uh, molecules moving from one side to the other. It was just the energy uh, moving. That was our heat uh, uh, flow. In this case, though, we have actually physical particles uh, moving uh, in the system. So we have a fan. Fan is forcing the air mo molecules to physically move, physically flow in a particular direction. And, and, and of course, um, if, if uh, there is some uh, heat involved, uh, 
those uh, hot uh, molecules are moving uh, with the flow, uh, flow as well. So that's really our uh, first uh, bullet um, in this um, uh, diagram or in this in the slide. Um, the second one, it says uh, fluid flow overlaps with a temperature gradient. So there is still a temperature gradient. There is a tendency for these um, uh, heat carriers uh, to move from high temperature to low temperature. So there is still a uh, conduction. OK, but conduction is not alone. Conduction due to this temperature gradient is helped by motion of the fluid. OK, so I, I use the term fluid here because it doesn't just have to be gas. It can be water, for instance. So um, water cooling is a very common um, uh, technique uh, used to uh, cool um, uh, instruments, hot uh, objects. So in that case, uh, there is this hot object um, and, and this hot object is um, the source of our heat. And, and the atoms in this hot object are vibrating like crazy. And, and those atoms are interacting, physically interacting with the water molecules and transferring their energy to the cold water molecules. And, 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 and the, the, the heat flow can therefore occur from the hot object into the water. But the water is not stagnant. You have a water flow. And, and because of the water flow, these uh, hot uh, uh, water molecules are basically moved away from that point. So constantly you are replenishing um, your water with cold water and so therefore maintaining a temperature differential. Okay? So um, um, again, we do have conduction because we do have a temperature differential, but on top of the temperature differential, we have this motion of um, the gas molecules or the water molecules that are getting hot, absorbing some of this energy, and being moved, forcefully being moved out of that hot place so that you can have these cold uh, water molecules, um, replacing them. Now we can, again, uh, heat them. And, and so the, the bottom line is we are helping. We are helping um, these, uh, uh, the conduction uh, to um, occur more uh, effectively. So there are two types of convection. One is free convection. The other is forced convection. A great example of natural convection is basically when you have uh, a radiator uh, in a room. The radiator is, is uh, um, providing uh, kinetic energy uh, to air molecules right above. And these uh, air molecules are in random motion here, and, and they are energetic. And if, if, the, um, um, uh, if they can um, um, win um, their battle uh, with the gravity, they can, you can understand that there will be a spread of these uh, molecules in, in all directions, and especially um, away from uh, the radiator. So you can imagine that as the water mole uh, the air molecules get hot in their random motion, some of these molecules will start going up and, and go to the ceiling, which is cold. And at that point, now these, these molecules are losing their um, uh, kinetic energy. And with the influence of gravity, they're going to uh, go down. Um, to uh, the floor. So this creates a natural flow uh, of air molecules. Um, uh, and, and this uh, is basically natural uh, convection. So we don't have any outside mechanism uh, forcing these uh, molecules to move. But naturally, these air molecules are, are moving because we have this uh, temperature differential uh, between the radiator um, and, uh, and, and, and the ceiling, and, and there is that, that motion of um, um, uh, air molecules constantly uh, uh, moving. So this is not just um, flow of heat, but actual molecules are, are moving. Okay? Now, in the case of forced convection, uh, the situation is a little different because we are not um, really waiting for these um, 
uh, hot uh, air molecules uh, to, to, to rise uh, in the room. Uh, in this case, we have a fan uh, forcing some air and therefore um, we, are, we have an established airflow um, uh, by this fan. So the air molecules here are moving uh, from left to right because of this fan. And if you have a hot object, these air molecules will pick that uh, energy uh, from the hot surface and, and uh, carry that heat away from that hot surface. So this can be a great way of cooling um, this, this hot, hot object as well. And this is, uh, this is um, very um, uh, commonly used in, in, in a lot of um, applications. Um, as I mentioned, water cooling is one of them, but also air cooling um, is, is, is used uh, very, very commonly in electronic uh, cooling. So um, this uh, uh, can be uh, described uh, by uh, Newton's uh, law of cooling. Uh, there's a, a very um, simple uh, equation here. Um, this is the convection equation where Q um, is uh, the heat flow uh, due to convection. H uh, is the heat transfer coefficient, and this is given in units of uh, watts per meter square uh, per Kelvin. And uh, that's multiplied by the area uh, exposed uh, to this um, um, flow um, of fluid. And then we have this um, temperature uh, differential. So the uh, resistance the thermal resistance um, of, the, uh, of the material uh, is given by um, the reciprocal of heat transfer coefficient uh, times area right here. So this, this uh, first equation we have here, therefore, can be written as uh, delta T uh, divided by uh, the thermal uh, resistance, which essentially is the conduction equation um, that uh, we have before. So the only thing new uh, we have here is how we calculate uh, the thermal resistance, and that's equal to 1 over H times A. Okay, So H, the heat transfer coefficient uh, of the material, is, is, is not a material property. It depends on uh, factors um, such as uh, properties of the fluid, um, uh, also nature of the uh, fluid flow, but also, also, um, the um, uh, the material that um, that um, uh, we have um, uh, for um, available for convection. Now, um, how is this uh, relevant? Well, uh, here's a great example of this. Um, in electronics, um, uh, we have these uh, heat sinks uh, for um, cooling. So a heat sink like this can be uh, characterized uh, using uh, a heat uh, transfer coefficient. And, and the thermal resistance of this uh, heat sinks uh, is given by 1 over H times A. And, and so uh, larger the area uh, you have, larger uh, the surface you have for uh, convection to occur. Again, this is... Um, happening because um, you have more atoms uh, on the solid heat sink interacting with the gas molecules of air. So again, the solid molecule, uh, solid atoms are vibrating. Um, so they are shaking like crazy uh, based on how much um, energy they have. And that energy is transferred uh, to the air mo molecules. And obviously, larger the surface area you have, larger um, uh, the dense, uh, larger the number of interactions or density of interactions you have uh, occurring between the solid uh, heat sink atoms um, and, and, and the gas molecules. So um, because of that, uh, a heat sink uh, will have these uh, fins uh, simply uh, to maximize um, uh, the surface area available for this convection uh, to occur. But of course, um, this is easier said uh, than done. When you are using these fins for cooling, um, you must be able to pass air uh, between these fins. So there's got to be a limit. <coughs> so if, if the spacing between the fins um, 
is very small, obviously it's going to be very difficult for the air molecules to flow um, easily uh, through that uh, opening. And, and as a result, the heat transfer coefficient um, of, the, of the heat sink will drop. So this is where <coughs> the uh, dimensions of the material uh, become, uh, optimization of the dimensions become important. So we can't just um, increase the number of fins because after a while, uh, the spacing between the fins uh, will be very uh, small and the air will not flow uh, freely uh, between the fins. So that's where uh, we, we have to model, uh, we have to model the heat sink and, and optimize the length um, uh, of the uh, fins as well as the uh, spacing uh, between them. So uh, here's an example. The, the heat transfer coefficient um, of, the, of a heat sink actually is calculated um, as um, a function of uh, air velocity. So as expected, as, as you uh, increase the um, uh, air velocity, the heat transfer coefficient, uh, the efficiency of this heat sink is, is um, improving uh, simply because you are able to replenish um, the, um, the hot air molecules with cold ones and you are able to maintain a nice temperature differential in the vicinity of the heat sink. Okay? And, and, and this is a strong dependence. In this case, the, the calculation is done uh, uh, using a fin height of uh, one millimeter, uh, fin thickness, um, that is, um, if you look at the fins like this, so you have uh, a fin thickness of 100 uh, uh, micrometers, and, and the fin spacing um, is uh, one mil millimeters. So it's quite large. Actually, um, I've done this calculation myself, um, and uh, the reason I'm using uh, one millimeter is because if I actually decrease um, the um, spacing uh, below uh, one millimeter, I've noticed that actually the performance um, is uh, deteriorating. So heat transfer coefficient is actually dropping uh, uh, when I do that. Um, in this case, uh, um, an assumption is made, and this is uh, the thermal conductivity of the material is 200 watts per meter Kelvin, which is a very good uh, thermal conductivity. So this is a metallic uh, thermal conductivity, a very high thermal conductivity. So what happens if, if we change this uh, thermal conductivity? And, and that's shown um, in this plot. And, and here, the heat transfer coefficient is plotted for a constant uh, uh, constant uh, air velocity of 1.4 uh, meter per second, and this is the walking speed. Um, and um, so, if you, if you walk, basically, uh, that corresponds to a certain uh, air velocity that's about 1.4 meter per second. Uh, dimensions are still um, the same. Uh, fin height is one millimeter, fin thickness is 100 micrometer, and fin spacing is uh, one millimeter. The horizontal axis is the thermal conductivity of the material. And, and the thermal conductivity uh, ranges from uh, 10 to the minus 1. So this is really an insulating, thermally insulating material going all the way up to uh, hundreds of um, um, watts per meter Kelvin. So this is a very good uh, conductor. Um, and this is essentially a, an insulator. So why are we doing this? And, and there's a personal story behind this, and I'd like to tell you that. Uh, well, uh, in, the, in the Assist Center, we are interested in uh, flexible devices, and uh, we are interested in cooling these flexible devices. So therefore, we need flexible heat sinks. Well, typically, um, uh, heat sinks are made of uh, metals like aluminum that conduct uh, heat well. So, uh, and you can see why um, you, you need that. Uh, the thermal conductivity is, uh, heat transfer coefficient is very low uh, when your thermal conductivity is, is poor, and then it goes up and, and uh, it saturates after a while. But you need this thermal conductivity in this range so that uh, you have a decent uh, heat transfer coefficient in the uh, 100 watt uh, per uh, meter square Kelvin range. And this is a fairly good heat transfer coefficient, actually. So, uh, so in, the, in the Assist Center, we are interested in creating flexible heat sinks, but we also are interested in creating small heat sinks. Um, 
And, and the reason for that is we are, we are uh, working on uh, variable electronics and uh, the uh, small form factor is, is very desirable for us because we don't uh, want people to wear these very clunky uh, heat sinks. Um, so if we limit ourselves to uh, heat sinks uh, that are only one, two, three millimeters tall, then um, something interesting happens. Well, what happens is that um, the, thermal, the importance of thermal conductivity drops. So why is that? Okay, so the reason is um, for heat um, to uh, leave uh, the heat sinks uh, by convection, okay, first the heat has to travel through the um, heat sink fins by conduction, okay, and, and during this process, of course, we have convection occurring and heat is being um, sent off the heat sink fins by convection, forced airflow. But because this distance, because this distance is not much, the fin height that is, this distance is not much, the heat does not have a large distance to travel before it can leave the fins um, via convection. Well, that means the thermal conductivity of the fin is not that important. There's not a whole lot of distance to travel so if even if my material has a slightly low thermal conductivity, I will be okay. And that's important because, well, then I can use materials that do not have uh, such great thermal conductivities like aluminum and, 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 uh, uh, and other metals. So I can, I can consider, for instance, uh, some plastics, uh, perhaps um, some doped plastics with... Um, um, addition of some uh, conductive elements in it, as long as, according to this uh, plot, as long as my uh, thermal conductivity is about um, 10 watt per meter Kelvin or so, I'm okay. Um, so the th uh, heat transfer coefficient uh, saturates and, and I have a decent heat sink. All right, so that uh, basically... Uh, uh, is is uh, is is convection. The final heat transfer mechanism is radiation, and uh, radiation uh, is something that we have studied before. In this case, uh, we don't have any uh, physical interaction uh, between uh, carriers of heat, like uh, molecules interacting, atoms interacting, and so forth. Instead, we have photons uh, carrying the heat. And this is electromagnetic radiation. And we know that uh, all uh, hot objects uh, emit uh, radiation um, and, and, and it's carried by uh, photons. And we can talk about uh, the wavelength uh, of photons emitted um, at, um, at different um, uh, temperatures. So thermal radiation um, is... Um, is, is um, uh, characterized by this equation, the wavelength uh, of light or photons emitted um, by a hot object uh, can be determined um, if we know uh, the temperature of the object. So in this case, for instance, this uh, hot uh, metal is, uh, is glowing red uh, because that temperature corresponds to a certain uh, wavelength uh, of photons. And infrared cameras uh, work because uh, the humans uh, basically radiate um, at, uh, at a certain wavelength, which uh, happens to be around uh, 9, uh, 10 uh, microns. So in, in uh, devices, uh, radiation usually is, uh, is small uh, compared to uh, conduction and, and convection. But for completeness, I think it's important to add this as, as another uh, mechanism.